Come on in, guys. Welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about Survivor's most disappointing returnees. There's nothing worse than watching your favorite player return to Survivor and flop harder than the latest CBS sitcom. Even the greatest of players will eventually have an untimely early exit under their belt, so it's an inevitable and painful rite of passage all Survivor fans will go through at one point or another. Lots of fan favorites have flopped on a second, third, or fourth try. But there are five that stand out to me as the most disappointing returnee belly flops in Survivor history. Now in this list, I'm not going to include players who were basically DOA on their returning season. For example, it was disappointing watching Tina, Hatch, Ethan, and Rob C all get voted out early in All Stars. But considering the huge anti-winner and anti-best-to-never-win sentiment that prevailed within the Jenna Lewises of that cast, there was literally no way that the winners or Rob Sesternino were ever going deep. It literally could not happen in a million iterations of the game. It's honestly a minor miracle that Ethan made as deep of a run as he did. So while it was personally disappointing to see those legends go out early in All-Stars, I don't think any of them performed in a disappointing manner. Obviously, there's a little bit of personal bias in my picks, but I'm going to try and keep it as objective as possible. So I'll be including players who had tons of hype going into their respective returning appearances, actually had a shot to go deep or play well, and completely drop the ball. So like, if you're a Troyzan stan and you were disappointed that in Game Changers he just sleepily rode the green monster all the way to final tribal council and then threw in the towel, that's all good, but I wouldn't exactly include him in a list of disappointing returnees because you can't disappoint if there are no expectations to begin with. Okay, you guys get the needle I'm trying to thread here. All that said, let's dig in to Survivor's five most disappointing returnee appearances. At number five is Yao Man in Survivor, Micronesia. Heading into Micronesia, Yao Man was easily one of the biggest fan favorites of the season, alongside Ozzy, Sari, and James. While Parvati and Amanda are obviously Survivor legends now, you've got to remember that at the time they were both sort of amber tier inclusions and dubious favorites at best. Parvati was mostly remembered for getting naked in a hot tub and making Yule so embarrassed he toasted without a glass, and Amanda was best remembered for, um, uh, her glazed over dead-eyed expressions and ever blurry bottom, I guess. Combine them with favorites like Eliza, Amy, Penner, and Fairplay that were various shades of villainous, and Yao Man's got a lot of heavy lifting to do as an actually heroic, actually fan favorite. And, uh, okay children, this will be on the test. What exactly did he do this season? No, no hands? No hands, huh? Well, he tackled fair play for an immunity idol, then got voted out in episode 3 when Sari sides with the couple's alliance instead of the alliance of Eliza, Amy, Penner, and Yao Man, an alliance so short-lived that no one ever even bothered to give it a name. Even within his own boot episode, it's Penner that does all the heavy lifting trying to convince Sari to side with them. Yao Mian's mostly non-existent. It's a pretty disappointing ending for a player who could have been as iconic and beloved as Sari if he'd had a second deep run on his second season. Instead, the only deep run Yao Man did in Micronesia was running Fairplay's head deep into that boat. At number four is JT in Survivor Heroes vs. Villains. It's honestly hard to even fathom this now, but I'll remind you all that JT played Survivor's first perfect game. And not only did he never receive a vote against him the entire season and collect every vote to win at the end, he also did it against incredible odds, entering the merge down in numbers and facing really tough competition at Final Tribal Council. He had players willing to literally give up in the game in order for him to advance further. I mean, there's winning Survivor, then there's winning Survivor, you know? If JT never came back to play again, he'd probably be almost universally recognized as one of the best ever. But as we all know, he came back. And boy, did he come back. Even though his Heroes vs. Villains gameplay is an absolute mess, I really love that he mixes up his approach to the game 
the second time out. Gone are the days of being even Steven. Instead, he puts himself as the perennial swing vote between the two major alliances on Hero Beach, and once Suri and Tom are both gone, is the de facto leader of the tribe. But somewhere along the way, JT gets this idea in his head that there's an all-woman alliance on the villain's tribe, catches some major big move-itis, and... <sighs> inexplicably gives his immunity idol to Russell, along with a handwritten note explaining how idols work. It's the childish, feminine handwriting for me. At the merge, Russell pretends he's with the heroes, Sandra tells Rupert that isn't the case at all, and Rupert alerts the rest of the hero tribe that maybe this Russell guy isn't exactly on the up and up. I've said it before and I'll say it again, when Rupert's the voice of reason on your tribe, you've got a serious problem. Of course, you all know what happens next. At a deadlocked 5-5 vote, Parvati idles out JT with his own immunity idol in one of the most embarrassing eliminations in Survivor history. I really do admire that JT swung for the fences in Heroes vs. Villains, and I thank his reckless overplaying for making this season the best season of reality television ever filmed. But let me remind you all, some people were suggesting we simply cancel Survivor after JT1 because no one would ever do it better. Him. This guy. At number three is the GOAT. No, not you. I mean GOAT as in greatest of all time. That would be Tony in Survivor Game Changers, proving that even the best to ever play can have a Jordan at the Wizard season and still maintain their reputation. Now, Tony's Game Changers performance is something I've actually defended on numerous occasions believe it or not. I mean, there's no question that the big names on Game Changers were going to be targeted by the literal who's that made up the other half of the cast. Game Changers was a big name bloodbath, but Suri and Aubrey and even Ozzy and Andrea proved that a big target could make a deep run here. However, Tony certainly did not help himself by running off into the jungle minute one to look for an idol, announcing his intention to do so. I still maintain that this was mostly a joke. Tony was basically playing with his reputation and having fun with the whole thing. I used to blame the other players for taking this so seriously. I mean, it's so obvious to me he's kidding. But folks, it's time for me to face the music. This was an all-time bad move. Joke or not, Tony, you are widely considered a god-tier winner on a very recent season who played one of the flashiest games in history. Your competition is a who's who of who's available. These second string players are not going to find this amusing and will only use it as an excuse to vote you out. Which is exactly what happened. After Sierra was eliminated first, Tony and Aubrey tried to rally the big threats together, briefly giving me a glimmer of hope that this season wouldn't be a big disappointment. But Sandra wisely realized that being the head of an alliance full of passive players was a much better deal than being a cog in the machine of a bunch of fantastic players. So the troops were rallied and Tony was voted out. Sure, the Sting of getting voted out second hurts, but getting voted out second by Troyzan, Michaela, Haley, and Varner? Ouch. The second most disappointing returnee outing is Kelly Wigglesworth in Survivor Cambodia. At first glance, this might be a little bit of a curious inclusion, but let me take you back to the spring of 2015 and the fan vote for Second Chance's 20 titular Second Chancers. Several old school players were somewhat surprisingly included in the fan vote for this cast, and even more surprisingly, voted in, giving longtime Survivor buffs a chance to see what some of these Survivor legends who'd basically dropped off the face of the earth were up to now. None was more hyped than Kelly Wigglesworth, Survivor's original runner-up, a woman who came within one vote of winning the very first season of Survivor. When she actually made it onto the cast, the hype was insane. It had been 15 years since she'd played Survivor Borneo, the single vote loss nagging away in the back of her head for a decade and a half. She'd certainly make the most of a second shot, right? Uh... 
Telly's game seemed absolutely frozen in time, and clearly her heart was not in this season, and she wasn't having fun. She formed an alliance with the other hard workers on her tribe like Terry and Wu, got swapped to Bion and joined the main Bion alliance, then after the merge was quietly blindsided by her own allies. There's nothing wrong with playing an old school kind of game, but Cambodia is one of the fastest paced seasons ever, Takeo one of the fastest paced tribes ever, and Kelly seemed completely unable and unwilling to adapt to a differently paced game. Which all makes sense when you learn that Kelly didn't even own a TV at the time, hadn't seen any survivor outside of her season, and she'd only even watched Borneo a few years prior. Like, this was the most she'd ever seen of Survivor. The most disappointing returnee outing in Survivor history is Colby in Survivor Heroes vs. Villains. It's impossible to overstate how much of a phenomenon Colby was back in his first season. He was Survivor's first true hero, a charming, good-looking Texas cowboy, a real man's man, but the kind of guy you could take home to mom too. He had an early exit in All Stars, but hey, that's okay. So did everyone else who people liked. So when Heroes vs. Villains was announced, a major celebration of Survivor's greatest characters and Candace, I think everyone was excited to see the old cowboy come out of retirement and put on the hat one last time. Colby's first impression to everyone right out of the gate is getting absolutely manhandled by Coach, which would unfortunately likely be a high point of his Heroes vs. Villains challenge game. In Australia, Colby was one of the greatest challenge performers in history. Now he's getting bodied by a guy who thought voting out a person who sells granola for a living was an impressive feat. It's mostly downhill from here, as Colby consistently underperforms in the challenges, leading James to call him Superman in a fat suit. There have been meaner things said on Survivor, but few things probably cut straight to the bone like hearing you were someone's adolescent hero and now they think you're a huge disappointment and flop. Of course, the heroes get completely outfoxed at the merge courtesy of JT, picked off one by one until fittingly, Colby is the final hero left. However, if Colby's early game was about disappointment, his end game in the final few episodes is about redemption, as he manages to navigate an imploding hero's tribe and gets a little gas in the tank to attempt a decent, if failed, Hail Mary play at final five after losing that immunity challenge. It's one of Survivor's most interesting single season returnee arcs ever, from legend to failure to redeemed legend again. With that final confessional and that famous pregnant pause, the perfect send off to Survivor's greatest hero ever. Well, second greatest hero. Got nothing else for ya. You don't have to get JT to write me a letter in his girlish script to show your appreciation. Just like and subscribe and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.